In the mid-1980s, 18-year-old Denise Diane Flum was a senior at Connorsville High School, Indiana. A hardworking student and a promising athlete, Denise had already been accepted into Miami University of Ohio. In school, she was involved with several sports teams, such as volleyball, basketball, softball, and track, and was a member of the National Honor Society. She intended on majoring in microbiology once she moved on to university and hoped to get a track scholarship. Tragically though, Denise would never get to realize her dreams. She disappeared one day in the spring of 1986 and has never been seen again. But first, I'd like to thank Aura for sponsoring today's episode. We cover a lot of cases here on Cold Case Detective, and sometimes the perpetrator seems to get off scot-free without ever paying for their crimes. But what if we told you that people are doing that right now to you? Those spam calls offering you the newest phone deal or emails trying to get you to sign up for some questionable product all stem from one initial issue, data brokers. While data brokers are legal, they are making a profit by selling your data to the highest bidder. Today's sponsor can help you fight back. Aura can identify data brokers and get them to take your name and number off the list. Not only that, Aura combines multiple services into one and you can try them out for free for two weeks by using our link in the description, aura.com slash coldcasedetective. It's easy to use and means you can access a VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, antivirus, and more, all for one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping your data safe online and stop the people profiting from your personal data. Use our link down in the description to try it out today and start your two-week free trial. Have a look and see how much of your data is out there and available on the dark web. Take control of your data with Aura. Denise was last seen on March 28, 1986, when she left her residence in Everton, Indiana, which she shared with her parents and sister. She climbed into her 1981 Buick Regal with the intention of finding her missing handbag. You see, the night before, she had attended a bonfire party on some farmland and believed that she had left her bag there. She had asked several of her friends to go with her to retrieve it, but no one was available to accompany her, so she decided to make the trip alone albeit reluctantly. Her mother, Judith, later noted that it was odd that the 18-year-old didn't want to make the trip by herself, stating, we're not sure why she didn't want to go alone. She was fearless ever since she was a child. So for her to be uncomfortable, to go back to the site to the party is unnerving. Something wasn't right. The tenant of the farm where the party was held reported that Denise never arrived. A separate farmer working in a field in Glenwood, Indiana, around three miles from the party location, saw Denise's Buick that day at around 12.30 p.m., but not the driver. A friend, however, saw the 18-year-old at 2 o'clock p.m. at a Fashion Bug store on 30th Street in Connorsville, although it's noted that the woman was wearing different clothing than that which Denise wore when she left home earlier that afternoon. Denise never returned home from her trip, and her parents never saw her again. The farmer near Glenwood who'd spotted her Buick noticed it was still parked there the following day, and notified the county sheriff's department as he speculated that the vehicle had been abandoned. By this time, Denise's family had already reported her missing. The response by authorities, though, left a lot to be desired. The flumes were told to stay calm that she would probably be home soon. But the police claimed she was likely just acting out, citing teenage behavior. Unsatisfied with this reply though, Denise's family decided to try and look for her themselves, calling all of her friends, but to no avail. 
Afraid she'd crashed her car, they drove up and down the country, searching for their daughter, or any signs of a car wreck. Her father, David, recalled, quote, We do not believe that she ever went back to the farm. Something, or some person, interrupted that opportunity to do so. We knew right away that something was wrong, because she had never been out without our knowledge about where she was going to be. When the time unfolded unto the next day, and the subsequent next days, then we knew we really had a problem." End quote. Judith recalled that she'd been working on the day of her daughter's disappearance, but she was home a little afternoon on her break, which is when she'd last seen Denise. She recalled, "'Before I went back to work that day, I had a gut feeling. Something did not feel right to me." Denise's cream-colored Buick sat empty just a half mile from Route 44, alongside Tower Road, which is described as a gravel lane near a barn east of Glenwood. As Denise had already been reported missing, investigators arrived and realized that her vehicle might hold some clues as to her whereabouts. There were no signs of a struggle though, and the car was locked. A search at the local area was conducted, but no evidence was found. Denise's parents told detectives that, as far as they knew, their daughter had no friends in the area where her car was located. Nobody knew why Denise would be out in this part of the country. There was no indication that she left on her own volition, and the police did not believe that she was a runaway. She was looking forward to university, was an active participant in school sports, as well as a straight-A student, and furthermore, took nothing with her when she left home the previous afternoon. She left behind her ID and the carrying case and cleaning solution for her contact lenses. NBC noted that her handbag was returned to her parents by a distant cousin about an hour after Denise left home, but for whatever reason, there was no way to let the 18-year-old know this. Less than a week after Denise went missing, on April 2nd, a 100-acre plot of land in rural Fayette County, where the party had taken place, was combed through both by police and firefighters. 300 acres of land were searched in Glenwood, around where her car was located, but neither search yielded any clues. Meanwhile, Denise's parents took time off work to assist with the investigation. While neither parent believed that she had run away, her mother, Judith, noted, We are not convinced that she ran away, but we hope that's what happened, because the alternatives are not good. Adding to the strangeness of the 18-year-old's sudden disappearance is the fact that she had been living a perfectly ordinary life beforehand. There was no change in behavior, no new people in her life, nothing that could lead investigators to a break in the case. Though she had recently broken up with her boyfriend of three years, a man named Sean McClung, her parents had noted that at the end of the relationship had prompted Denise to become more sociable. The pair had split up about one month before she vanished. As time passed, investigators struggled to move the case forward. There was simply no indication as to Denise's fate. Nothing had been found that could lead them to her whereabouts, or tell them that she was deceased. There were no car keys, no fingerprints, no blood samples. Ten days after she went missing, detectives requested that citizens of Lawrence County, Indiana, keep their eyes and ears open. Though they had no indication that she was in the area, they noted that she had many friends and acquaintances from her various sports activities. A few tips trickled in about possible sightings of the 18-year-old, but none were ever confirmed. Using her address book, detectives spoke with various friends and schoolmates of Denise's, but again, this led nowhere. Nobody had seen her nor heard from her. She hadn't mentioned anything suspicious lately, and her behavior had been completely ordinary. By all accounts, Denise was not the kind of young woman to run away from home. By May, a reward of $10,000 for information leading to her whereabouts was offered, though nobody ever claimed it. Little information came in off the back of this reward, and the investigation quickly dried up. With nothing to work with, detectives were forced to move on to other cases. On August 10, 1988, over two years after Denise went missing, her mother Judith received a phone call from a young woman in Norfolk, Virginia. Judith recalled, 
the girl said things that sounded too much like our daughter. We felt compelled to drive to Norfolk. The woman claimed to be Denise and had called on Judith's day off, which was information only Denise would know. However, when the family met the woman, she said that she didn't know who they were and denied ever calling them. The woman later confessed that she had in fact called the Flumes and that she had done so because she believed she'd seen Denise at a local shopping center. Of course, none of it was true in the end. Despite it all being a cruel hoax, the Flumes declined to press charges against the woman. Decades passed, and no new progress in the case was ever made. Indiana State Police Detective Scott Jarvis stated that while there had been rumors about Denise's fate, there were virtually no solid leads. There's not one constant theory. There isn't anyone we focused on, or any persons of interest, he said. Jarvis also noted that there was pressure to finally solve the case and put it to bed stating that the more time passed, the harder it was to solve. He stated, any time this much time goes by, any potential witnesses could have died or moved on. The longer this goes on, the more rumors that come about. In 2014, Denise's DNA was extracted from a baby tooth and submitted to the National DNA Database System, but no matches were found. Over the years, Case evidence was lost or destroyed, meaning modern day forensic techniques could not be applied, and potential clues were permanently out of reach. With any case this old and lacking any real solid leads, several theories eventually surfaced as locals and online sleuths began to speculate about what had become of 18 year old Denise Flume. One theory is that Denise had seen something that she shouldn't have when she went to the farm to look for her missing handbag. Another is that while she drove, she ran into an anonymous killer. Perhaps they'd flagged her down or followed her and forced her to pull over. Prison inmates have claimed to know the identity of Denise's abductor and have even bragged that they know the location of her buried body. But these leads have never panned out and Denise remains missing. It's worth noting that there has also been some criticism of the original investigation. The lead detective assigned to the case, a man named Ted McQuinley, was the cousin of Denise's father, and it was observed that his investigation lacked documentation, records, and detailed notes, with much of the inquiry relying heavily upon McQuinley's memory. This may have set newer investigators back, as it's possible that potential leads and witnesses are missing from the case files. In 2018, the Fayette County Sheriff's Department announced that they were taking a fresh look at Denise's case. Using the help of retired detective supervisor Tom Barker, investigators began to retrace old leads, re-examine case files, and re-interview witnesses. Around the same time, the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary in Connorsville was searched. Cadaver dogs alerted authorities to the possibility of human remains at the fourth pond of the sanctuary. An examination was delayed due to torrential rains, but when the pond was finally searched, nothing was found. The sanctuary had been looked into after investigators received a tip from the former girlfriend of a person of interest in the case. Later that year, in December, Sean McClung, Denise's ex-boyfriend, was interrogated by detectives. In 2017, McClung had taken a voice stress test an iffy interrogation tool, which is reportedly less accurate than a polygraph test, and authorities noted that he had failed it. McClung is a notable person in Denise's case. Though he was never declared a suspect nor a person of interest, he left town in 1986, shortly after the disappearance. He moved to Arizona and did not participate in searches for Denise. Furthermore, despite their three-year relationship, he seemed largely unaffected by her disappearance. While in Arizona, McClung gathered a lengthy criminal history of domestic violence. He returned to Connersville in 2017, where he was subsequently approached by investigators working on Denise's case. Interestingly, he had claimed for years that his ex-girlfriend was still alive. Two years later, in early 2020, authorities reported that new information had come to light 
and led them to believe Denise was no longer alive, and sadly, had died at the hands of another person. They believed her remains had been buried in an undisclosed location in rural Fayette County. Although authorities combed the area and used ground-penetrating radar and cadaver dogs, Denise's remains were not found. In July of 2020, while being held for an unrelated fraud charge, Sean McClung confessed to taking Denise's life back in 1986. He claimed that the 18-year-old had picked him up on March 28th, the day that she vanished, and that they had argued. During the argument, McClung killed Denise, though it's unclear how. He then called several friends to help him move the body. McClung admitted his story to the police in exchange for immunity and dismissal of the other two unrelated charges. But part of the agreement was that he was not to withhold any information. When he was unable to supply investigators with the location of Denise's body, his immunity was withdrawn, and he was charged with voluntary manslaughter. Unfortunately, however, nothing further ever came from this. At the time of his arrest, McClung was already suffering from an undisclosed terminal illness. He died at the age of 56 on September 26, 2020, all before a trial could take place. Notably, five days before his death, McClung recanted his confession, telling his lawyer that he didn't know what happened to Denise, and that he'd only confessed to taking her life because he wanted to avoid jail time. Though Denise's parents were devastated that they still had no answers, and were unable to bring their daughter home, they conceded that several details in McClung's confession didn't match the facts of the case. They admitted that they'd had their reservations about the confession from the beginning, but believed that he knew more than he was letting on. Few updates have come in Denise's case since McClung's death. In the spring of 2021, Equisearch Midwest, in conjunction with CCRT, Indiana Canine Search and Recover, alongside the Fayette County Sheriff's Department, conducted a search for Denise's remains. The specific areas searched in Fayette County have not been disclosed, and the search carried on for about 12 hours. However, no discoveries were reported. An NBC report from 2020 saw Fayette County Sheriff Joey Laughlin state that there were several persons of interest in the case, but simply not enough evidence to charge anyone. He added, we believe more than one person is involved, by statements they've made or by their relationship to Denise. Now in their 70s, Denise's parents are afraid that they might not see justice for their daughter. They are offering a $25,000 reward for information leading to Denise's location and to the arrest of the person or people responsible for her presumed demise. 18-year-old Denise Diane Flume was last seen in Connersville, Indiana, when she left her home on the afternoon of March 28, 1986. Denise is described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She has pierced ears, wears contact lenses, and is 5 foot 6 inches. She weighed 135 pounds at the time of her disappearance. When she was last seen, she was wearing a red Motley Crue t-shirt in a size medium blue striped jeans in a size 11, white trainers in a size 9, and two rings. One is gold with a garnet, while the other is a silver class ring with a red setting. Denise was driving a cream-colored 1981 Buick Regal on the day of her disappearance, though the vehicle was located in Glenwood, Indiana one day after she went missing. If you have any information about Denise's disappearance, you can call the Fayette County Sheriff's Department at 765-825-1110 or the Indiana State Police at 765-778-2121. This is Cold Case Detective.